Hello and welcome to another episode of the Anglican Renaissance Podcast. Today I have with me a guest, Reverend River Devereaux. We're going to be talking not only about the historic Anglican position on divorce and remarriage, um, but the biblical position on divorce and remarriage. Um, I think this is such an interesting topic, and I hadn't really looked into it a lot before um, Reverend River on his YouTube channel started covering it and started talking about it. Um, but then once I did look into it, it was shockingly clear to me how um, how neglected this this important biblical doctrine is. I don't I don't personally think Jesus could be that much clearer about um, this doctrine uh, compared to say lots of other doctrines that conservative Christians hold very, um, think are very important, like monogamy, um, which I think this issue touches on. Um, so I just wanted to have Reverend River on to, to talk and explain what the biblical position is, how we know that's the biblical position, um, uh, and what that might look like in application. And, and additionally, in, in addition to that, maybe, um, the as Anglicans, how we come at this, how this position has historically been represented um, in in the Anglican communion. Thank you so much for coming on, Reverend River. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to see you and uh, good to talk about this very important issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. So do you want to start with just briefly what the maybe the different positions are? Uh, you can either start with scripture and see how people interpret the different uh, passages. Um, sure. <clears throat> differently or, or 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 yeah so of course there are some people who think that you can just divorce and remarriage and remarry for any reason right but yeah. like that's just not uh, a, a position that you can actually have if you are faithfully reading the new testament mm -hmm. so in terms of people who want to faithfully obey jesus's teachings paul's teachings who are reading the new testament believe it's inerrant and that kind of thing there are only a handful of positions out there of course i only think that one of them is the correct one so some people believe that you can divorce your spouse for usually they'll say the three a's for adultery abuse abandonment and then if you if you divorce them for one of those reasons and you are the innocent party you can then remarry afterwards because those three things mean that it's like lawful for you to divorce them so if you divorce them for a, for a silly reason it's a sin to have done that and so it also be wrong for you to remarry uh but if it, it's for abandonment abuse adultery those are sufficient reasons to divorce that's the most liberal view and this view doesn't believe that marriage is indissoluble that view would say that divorce does always dissolve a marriage. It's just that it doesn't always lawfully dissolve a marriage, if you know what I mean. So even if you divorce someone for the wrong reason, um, you're still actually no longer married to them and, and that sort of thing. That's the most liberal position. Then moving a little bit more closer to what Jesus actually said would be the view that you can only divorce for adultery and if you were the innocent party, so if your spouse committed adultery, and if you divorce them for adultery, you can then remarry. And the reason why is because they believe that adultery dissolves the marriage. But anything else other than adultery and death does not dissolve the marriage. So even if you if you divorce them for a wrong reason, you're actually still married to them, which is why a remarriage would be adultery. That's definitely getting us closer to the truth. It's just that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no biblical basis for believing that adultery dissolves a marriage. It's something they're having to read into a particular clause in Matthew 19, 9. And then there is uh, very close to the truth, the view that adultery doesn't dissolve a marriage. If you divorce your spouse for any reason uh, and then remarry, you're committing adultery with one little exception which is that if you divorce a, a non-Christian, a non-baptized Christian, then you can actually remarry after that, so long as you divorce them for the right reasons, because if it's with a non-Christian, the marriage is a little bit different. That's the Roman Catholic position. I go further than them. Uh, they, they believe that based on 1 Corinthians 7, 
And I, I believe that whether it's two non-Christians or two Christians or one Christian, one non-Christian, if they are validly married, then only death can dissolve their marriage. And so if you divorce them for any reason and then remarry, you are committing adultery because you're still actually married to that person, even if you divorce them. So that's, I think there's, there's other views too, but those are sort of, that's sort of the main spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to talk about, um, one of the things I think I wouldn't have understood before really looking into the issue is the distinction between, say, divorce and annulment or divorce. Yes, you're divorced, but that doesn't mean you can remarry um, because the, the issue is remarriage after divorce. How does it set you up um, for a future um, a marriage? And we'll probably get into how people read the different um, the, the kind of exception clause, because that's really what it comes down to as far as I understand uh, and and. Yeah, forgive me if I'm wrong, but Jesus basically says, um, if you, and maybe you'll read this later, but basically there's an exception clause for sexual immorality. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, the, I would have sit, thought, okay, well, he's saying you can divorce for adultery by that. Um, but I think there's a better reading um, yeah. of that, of that line, which makes it actually make more sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want to get into maybe, what does the Bible say? Where, where are we getting these from in in, in scripture from Jesus and sure, Paul. sure. So yeah, so the standard Protestant view, this is the view that most you know conservative Protestants have, whether they're Presbyterian or or Lutheran or whatever, is that you can it, it's it's that view that you can divorce for adultery if you're the innocent party and then remarry. Uh, they get that based on Matthew nineteen nine, which I read for you now, where Jesus says. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So they think that that what he's saying there is that, yeah, any other reason if you divorce and remarry, it's adultery unless your spouse committed sexual immorality. I don't think that when he says except for sexual immorality, he's allowing you to remarry though. Now, we could start there or, or do you want to talk a little bit more about some of the other passages so that we can sort of ease our way over to there? How, how um, I, I think, I think let's, let's start here. I think one of the revealing things, another good resource for this, I think both of us have, have read, you've had conversations with Jack Shannon, the book that yeah. I recently started reading that I thought was particularly helpful oh, on this, this countryman, <laughs> yeah, countryman and swagger yeah. um, where, what, what does it mean when he says, except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery if you divorce except for um sexual immorality and the, the the question is basically he's saying when you divorce someone this is as far as i understand this you're inciting them to commit adultery unless mm -hmm. it is the reason you're divorcing them is sexual immorality so yes but and at first you're like oh okay so you can divorce if it, sexual morality was the reason the thing that clicked for me is he's saying well no you just didn't cause her to commit adultery if that's the reason otherwise yeah. it would be the man is the cause of of yeah. the sexual immorality or the or the adultery um if he did divorce her if that wasn't the case so that's correct realizing yeah. that it's not actually um an, an exception in the way that we you might first read it, I think is really helpful. Um, at least that's the thought that I've, I've had. Well, uh, a realization I've had after looking into the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I can make a very quick case because um, I've got more long form stuff on it, but the, the, the quick case would be this. First of all, there are other places in scripture, namely Romans seven, first Corinthians seven and Mark 10, where it is unequivocally taught that divorce and remarriage is adultery, and there's no exceptions given to the rule. Mm -hmm. And so you have to just then wonder, well, if there actually is an exception to that rule, why did Paul in Romans 7 and 1 Corinthians 7 and Mark and Mark 10 not make that exception clear, especially since that exception is a very important exception because uh, mm -hmm. divorce for sexual immorality is, you know, that's one of the main causes of divorce. So you'd think yeah. that you want to mention that, but it's just not mentioned in those things. It's just no exception, divorce, and remarriage is adultery. Not only that, but they hinge that teaching on the fact that marriage is indissoluble. Mark hinges it on the fact that what God has joined together, let not man separate. And Paul hinges his teaching that you can't remarry 
without committing adultery on the fact that he says in Romans 7, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. And he says it also in uh, 1 Corinthians 7.39. So you have the basis into soul ability for an unequivocal teaching. <clears throat> but then you get to Matthew 19.9, and all of a sudden Jesus says, well, actually, people think he's saying you can remarry if it's for the cause of sexual morality. Well, then you'd have a contradiction. Because you, you, it, it's a bit, the reason I say contradiction because is because that exception is actually so significant that it would seem to contradict the plain sense of Mark 10, Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 7. Mm -hmm. Rather than just him adding another, uh, some more nuance to the issue, it seems to be a different position altogether. If yeah. Paul is outright saying marriage is only dissolved by death, and now Jesus is saying, oh, well, maybe it's, you know, you can remarry for adultery, that would suggest that adultery dissolves a marriage. It's just that that's never actually taught anyway. So that's why all of a sudden you might be motivated to try and harmonize this and try and figure out what's going on. And then sure enough, when you look closely, you can see that that's actually not really what Jesus is saying. First of all, uh, I only realized this recently. Matthew 19, 9 is a scripture that is contested. It's actually not in a number of manuscripts. It's not in uh, the Codex Sinaiticus, for instance, how, in, in, in the sense of how we have it in our English Bibles. Mm -hmm. Most manuscripts, Matthew 19.9 is exactly the same as Matthew 5.32. If that is the original reading, then this issue all of a sudden just disappears because you can't take this uh, view that you can remarry after adultery from Matthew 5.32. That's just something to note. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a like a majority text, Texas Receptus guy. So I, I'm not so much into that argument anyway, but for those who are, I thought I'd just mention it. Mm. But in Matthew's gospel, you have a number of instances where Jesus gives a teaching twice in, the, in Matthew's gospel. And it, it's always just a duplicate. It's just Matthew just repeating the same teaching. In none of those instances are the teachings any different or Jesus, you know, it's just, it's just the same teaching. And so Matthew 19, 9 is indeed a duplicate of a passage in Matthew 5, which is Matthew 5, 31 to 32 in the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Jesus says. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So what's going on here? He's saying that if you divorce your wife, you're essentially forcing her to remarry because, you know, women back then couldn't inherit property and essentially would have to be married. So if you divorce your wife, you're making her commit adultery by essentially forcing her to remarry. And therefore you're complicit in it, which would make you an adulterer as well. Unless you divorced her for adultery because she's already made herself an adulteress. So you're not complicit in making her an adulteress, she did it all by herself. But here's the really important thing to note about Matthew 5.32. There are two mentions, two references to remarriage in that verse, and they're both unequivocally adultery. Mm -hmm. So the first one is makes her commit adultery, right? That's obviously referring to remarriage, makes her commit adultery. Notice that Jesus is saying unequivocally it's adultery for her to remarry, even if she's the innocent party, which this verse is clearly suggesting some he's he's clearly talking about some sort of husband who is just divorcing his wife for some stupid reason and he's making her have to remarry and jesus is saying unequivocally it would be adultery for her to do that mm -hmm. so right all, all of a sudden we see very clearly now that actually marriage must be indissoluble because mm -hmm. even if he divorced her for the wrong reason and she's done nothing wrong. Yeah, sorry. Even if even if she's done nothing wrong and, and her lousy husband divorced her, it's adultery for her to remarry. Why? Because she's actually still married to him. So the first reference to remarriage in Matthew 5.32, unequivocally adultery. The second one, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery unequivocally. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say, oh, unless that woman was the innocent party. No, no, no. Just anyone who marries a divorced woman, period, commits adultery. And so, so you see that unequivocally again. So the exception clause in Matthew 5.32, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, that, that clause except for the sexual immorality, what, that's, what that clause is doing is only exonerating the husband 
for divorce, specifically divorce, if the wife committed adultery. It's not allowing him to remarry, and it's not allowing her to remarry. That's very, very clear there in Matthew 5.32. It's not hard to mm-hmm. figure out what's going on there. So if you're reading Matthew's gospel, you, from that verse alone, you can now see that marriage is, is not dissolved by divorce, and remarriage is therefore adultery. And that divorce is adultery. It's, it's adultery to divorce someone unless you divorce them for adultery. Now, I think that's actually still true in today's context, too, because you might say, well, that's just Jesus' culture where, you know, women was like forced to remarry. That's not the same today. I actually think it is. I think that <clears throat> most people who get divorced remarry. And so mm-hmm. if you divorce your spouse, they're probably going to remarry. And so I think the, the same holds true. You essentially are becoming complicit in their remarriage. Maybe you could say if you divorced your spouse and they don't remarry, okay, maybe you're not complicit then because they never did it. But if they did do it, you are complicit in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you want to say anything before we move to Matthew uh, 19.9? Uh, no, just, and I already said this, I guess, but uh, th- realizing that his accept clause there is about causing the woman to commit adultery was a huge, you know, the, the cogs connecting in my head thing, because it's not yeah. actually saying that that's not a um, invalid divorce. It's saying that that just, you, you're not, we're, you're not responsible for the sexual sin because yes. committed sexual. And it makes more sense. Again, when it, 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 it's the only way to accurately understand what he says right after, which is that mm-hmm. all of these contexts of remarriage without the qualification are adultery. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Something to note in, in in the in the entire New Testament, every single reference to a divorced woman remarrying, it's always adultery. There is never any exception given once for a divorced woman being able to remarry. The exception clause is always just talking just about the husband. Now that that leads some people <laughs> to actually think that um, a woman can never remarry, but maybe a man can because they believe that polygamy is possible and men. Um, yeah. A woman can't be married to multiple men, but a man can be yeah, married can, to multiple Yeah, we can women. talk about that too, because it seems, I think the ontological view about what a marriage is, is important here. And it yeah. does seem like, I think in Matthew 19, Jesus establishes his logic on the the Genesis 2, 24, mm-hmm. a man will leave his father and mother and become one flesh. And he's like, how will one flesh be separated? Like, it just can't. That's not an ontological mm-hmm. possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, but then yeah. we also do see polygamy in the old testament right so some people will try to incorporate kind of uh, polygamy into explaining yes it is an ontological fact that you're still married but there's some wiggle room or you know i'm wondering how you how you tackle that yeah we can get we'll get we can get there whenever you want Uh, obviously i don't agree with that i don't i don't believe in polygamy at all and i i bring i brought that up just to illustrate the fact that it is clear that there's no exception given for a woman now the reason why that is is because it's the, it's the man divorcing his wife would actually basically force her to remarry. Okay, so moving to Matthew 19, 9. Uh, we've already read it before. Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and, makes, and, and marries another commits adultery. Now, how I interpret this verse and how the Anglican church historically did and how the early church unanimously did until um, the 5th century, really, is that... Jesus is saying, whoever divorces his wife commits adultery unless it was for sexual morality, and whoever remarries always commits adultery. So just to just like to make it a bit clearer, I think the exception clause, except for sexual morality, only modifies the clause before it, whoever divorces mm-hmm. his wife. It doesn't modify what comes after it, marries another. Yeah. And you might think, okay, well, that just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like that's what he's saying well a few things to note one jesus uh well jesus didn't uh probably say this in koine greek but this is written in koine greek two thousand years ago Mm -hmm. so saying that doesn't sound right to my ears isn't really a good enough argument if this isn't even the language and this is two thousand years ago i bring the 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 age up because people back then had different sort of ways of speaking different you know imagine someone from even I don't know, the 1920s coming today and, and hearing a bunch of Zoomers talk, they wouldn't be able to understand <laughs> a lot of it. And so it's you, that whole, it doesn't sound quite right 
isn't very uh, isn't really a good argument. Two, we have evidence that people who actually spoke this language around this time read it that it only modifies the divorce and not the remarriage. So the Shepherd of Hermas, which was written in the second century, and many fathers actually thought it was scripture, uh, believes that you can divorce your spouse if they committed adultery, but you can never remarry. We have other examples as well of fathers who believe that. And so they they saw it that way, and they're writing and speaking Koine Greek 2,000 years ago. And then the third thing to say is that's not even true anyway, because even in English, we can we often construct sentences this way. To give an example, whoever breaks into another man's house, unless it's to save his neighbor from a fire and steals his belongings, commits burglary. Okay, so let's think about what I said. Whoever breaks into another man's house, unless it was to save him from a fire and steals his belongings, commits burglary. Clearly, when I said unless it was to save him from a fire, that only modifies the first half, the breaking mm-hmm. the house part, not the stealing the belongings part. That would always be burglary. That would always be burglary if I did that. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's other examples you can think of. Jack Shannon, who we've mentioned, he's he came up with one. Uh, whoever hires a hitman, unless it's to help him do uh, housework and, um, and plots to murder someone, commits criminal conspiracy. So, you know... Th- if you think about it, you can actually think of lots of, of examples like this. And so that's what we think Jesus is doing. He's saying, whoever divorces his wife commits adultery unless it was for the cause of sexual morality, but whoever remarries always commits adultery. Yeah. And it's sure enough, he's already said that exact same thing in Matthew 5.32. So mm-hmm. if Jesus is now saying that you can remarry, he's actually contradicting not only Mark 10 and Romans 7, he's actually contradicting Matthew 5.32 as well. Yeah. So, and and yeah. there is something to the fact that many, you know, maybe even most manuscripts, Matthew 19.9, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice a bit, is the same as Matthew 5.32. Mm-hmm. Potentially it's because the verse could have been seen as a little bit confusing or something. And they just said, look, it actually just means the same thing. And we're just going to, we'll just put that in there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe something like that. We're not quite sure what happened there, but it's an interesting thing to consider anyway. Yeah. So yeah, there there you go. That's Matthew 99. Exactly. Yeah. Just, I mean, I think it's so helpful to have the full context of Matthew 19 as well, which is the Pharisees are trying to stump Jesus, which they do repeatedly, where they try to give him a hard situation. And then he gives a third answer. They're expecting one of two answers and he doesn't give them one of the two answers. And instead he, you know, they think that they're, that he's going to be um, loose on marriage or too strict and he's going to violate Moses. And then he basically, you know, this is also a famous, in my opinion, good argument for Jesus's claim to divinity that he says he outranks the Bible basically, or, or Moses. He just starts saying, yeah, Moses says, yeah, sure. But that was because of the hardness of your heart. And I am saying to you, okay, and he grounds that commandment that he is giving on Genesis. He just says it's about that one flesh union. That's a fact. You either are one flesh or you are not one flesh. The logic, in my opinion, doesn't follow that, you know, you can you can do a specific type of divorce, which does break your one flesh union, um, but the rest don't. It just seems like a universal principle that you are either one you are one flesh when you get married and that's the logic for this argument against divorce um yeah yeah. absolutely and and paul makes it explicit in romans 7 and first corinthians 7 where he says a woman's married to her husband as long as as he lives Mm -hmm. and so yeah that's that's implicit maybe even more than implicit in in the gospel passages and it's explicit in paul yeah and why we actually also have Old Testament evidence for this as well, where God's covenant with Israel is often likened to being a marriage. And we know that that covenant is indissoluble. We yeah. even see in Ezekiel 16, uh, the whole chapter is very clear that God's covenant with Israel is a marriage. He says, despite your adultery, we're still mm-hmm. in the covenant. The covenant's <laughs> not dissolved. And that's really important. Uh, because there's actually no basis for this view that adultery would dissolve the covenant, because if that was true, then God's covenantal promises would actually be dissolved as well, which they're not. Yeah. So, and 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 by the way, if adultery dissolves a marriage, then Paul's whole point in Romans 7 would fall apart too. 
he's saying yeah. just as a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives we're bound to the law as long as you live baptism which you know gives us the spiritual death and rebirth frees us from the law and but if actually it turns out that adultery just ends you know the, a covenant anyway then that mm -hmm. whole issue wouldn't matter anymore israel's adultery in terms of their sin in regards to god's covenant would have dissolved the marriage and they'd be and then this problem wouldn't exist in the first place yeah i i think it's 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 also so hard for us because of our assumptions but then try to assume the assumptions of the people the, the biblical audience as well one of the things that i think is is interesting is again in the book of romans in general paul is dealing with judaizers who are saying basically God made a covenant with Israel, Israel as this visible covenant community, and it can't be extended unless Israel is extended. And what Paul basically says in Romans 9 isn't that that's that. OK, well, because think about it. If they thought divorce ontologically separated people, he could just say, well, God's divorcing half of Israel because that's why they're not following. But instead, he says, actually, from the beginning of time, there are some people who he didn't elect, who he aren't a part of his invisible bride esau he hated right so these are these people who it, it was a decision that he made not to be married to them in, in that sense in that analogy and then there never was this it's not saying that they are dissoluble which would be an easy out i think if that mm. was the way that he conceived of it in romans line. maybe this is a novel argument but no no it's a very know. important argument yeah, yeah so yeah keep going yeah i i just think that you know <laughs> people who've been watching my channel long enough to know that i wrestled with predestination but literally just looking at marriage as the analogy for election, okay? You realize how central this idea of marriage is to the way we are saved. Like, it's not just some tertiary uh, mm. issue about, uh, you know, social rules or whatever, right? Um, it, 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 it's it, the analogy that Paul consistently gives for how we're saved is because we are married to God. And if yeah. these marriages were not, you know, eternal promises, if, the, the, if that's almost the reason marriage even exists cosmologically is to analogize the relationship God has with his people and they were dissolubable, it would, it would kind of, it would kind of make no sense. Like there would be no assurance of salvation. There'd be no anything. It, most of the logic of the New Testament would fall apart. Oh, one hundred percent. And and this is what's so strange because I've heard Reformed Christians, you know, and in yeah. Reformed theology, you're supposed to think that there's one covenant, right? Yeah. Say, oh well, no, you can divorce and remarry because God divorced Israel and remarried. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, yeah. that's completely that's crazy. And Paul yeah. makes this explicit. He says in Romans and and is it Romans nine or maybe it's eleven? He says, "Has God abandoned His people?" By no means, yeah. he's not abandoned his people. Yeah. He's remained faithful to his people. It's just that not all who are in Israel are part of Israel. Not all who mm -hmm. are Abraham's uh, offspring, sperma, are his children. Yeah. God is, has remained faithful to the covenant to Abraham's children, so that not all Jews are actually Abraham's children. And yeah. so that's a really important thing. It's just yeah. like you said, yeah, he's he's just expanding what Israel is rather mm -hmm. than yeah, the idea that he's divorcing yeah. the jews and remarry it that's just not that's if you have that view your whole view of the biblical narrative is going to be in, in yeah. serious trouble actually and yeah. uh some people bring up the fact that in jeremiah 3 god says that he's going to give israel a bill of divorce mm -hmm. the issue with that is that literally three verses later he takes her back the the prophets are full of very sort of extravagant language to express you know just how severe Israel's sin is and that sort of thing, and so yeah, God does say I, I give you a bill of divorce, but yeah, He takes it back and and then again in Ezekiel sixteen, her adultery doesn't dissolve the marriage. We also see throughout Isaiah where God actually says you know we're married, I was your husband, you are unfaithful to me, and He actually says in Isaiah for a time you know, I sent you away, but I'm going to take you back. So, so there isn't this idea that adultery dissolves the marriage and there's no, there's no sense in which God divorced his people and, and then remarried. Uh, I don't see how you could really interpret Galatians and Romans at all. If you, if you have that view, Paul's at pains to make clear in Galatians and Romans that God has remained faithful to his covenant has not broken it. And that mm -hmm. when he says to Abraham, you know, I'll be your God and the God of your children the the children he was referring to when he made that promise 
he's remained faithful to them. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So maybe talk about, uh, I guess we can start talking about Paul's doctrine of divorce because he does talk about divorce actually quite a bit uh, in, in the New yeah. Testament or marriage or, and, and what are the obligations of a marriage. I think to lots of people, for instance, the idea that you could get divorced but not remarried doesn't make sense because what is a divorce? Um, mm. But something that, that, that I've talked about maybe before or I had to realize is when you are married to somebody, you have obligations to them that if you were divorced, you wouldn't have, um, but you doesn't mean you can necessarily get remarried. So um, maybe talk a little bit about how, how, how Paul deals with it. Sure. Just before we get there, just, just for important context, in the Gospels, when Jesus refers to divorce, the word for divorce there just means send away. Mm. Uh, so, in fact, when Jesus sends away the crowds, he uses that same word. So it doesn't, it, it's not some, it's not like the English word divorce, which is this legal category of dissolving mm -hmm. a marriage. It just means to send her away. And that's why I think even the KJV actually translates it as send, sends her away. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, whenever we hear that word divorced, don't think for, for people listening that that saying dissolve a marriage, dissolve a marriage, that's mm -hmm. our sort of modern way of seeing it. We're just, what, what, what it's going to really refer to is just separation but you're actually still ontologically married. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, 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 the Pauline passages, you've got Romans seven, which is quite brief. And, and Paul is bringing it up to make a point where he just says that uh, in verse two, a married woman is bound by law to her husband for as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. So unequivocal marriage is only dissolved by death. And then you can remarry after that. The main passage, though, is 1 Corinthians 7. Of course, a very important passage for marital ethics in general. A uh, few things to note for maybe later. First of all, Paul does say that a married couple should come together, which, which clearly means sleep together, uh, so that they are not enticed to sexual immorality. You know, if a married couple have a sexless marriage, it's probably quite likely that a sin will be committed at some point because of our sexual urges. It's important to note, though, that he says in verse six, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am. I bring that up now, just anticipating the past replication to this. I think we see here the seeds for this position that I take, that if you are remarried, you should become celibate because uh, even having sex with your spouse uh, is something that Paul says is a concession, not a command. It's actually better to be celibate. Okay, moving on, though. Uh, Paul says in verse 10, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. So he's, he's saying this is what Jesus taught. Sure enough, it is what Jesus taught. Notice, though, since he's saying this is what Jesus taught, he doesn't bring up the exception clause. Uh, the wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Okay, so we see there two commandments. Don't divorce. If you do, don't remarry. Mm. Um, again, though, if, if he's going to say, if you do divorce, you should remain unmarried or else be reconciled. I think that you can also take from there this view that if you are remarried, then you should be uh, celibate, which we might talk about later. Mm -hmm. Now, notice that he gives the same commandment to men and women. So he's not, you know, it's, it's, it's the same for both. He then says, verse 12, to the rest, I say, not I, but the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So even if you're an unbeliever, even if you're married an unbeliever, this is still the case, uh, which is why I don't agree with the Roman Catholics that maybe you can remarry if there was a divorce under certain circumstances to an unbeliever. Uh, no, Paul's saying it's the same situation. And he makes it really clear in verse 14 for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children be unclean, but as it is, 
their holy well, proof text for infant baptism. But more importantly, we're seeing that even if you're married to an unbeliever, the marriage is actually still the, the same, has the same ontological sta- uh, status. Mm-hmm. Um, here's the key, the key, though. This is why people sometimes think there's an exception. He then says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Now, what does this mean? What does he mean in such cases the brother and sister is not enslaved? Now, some people think that means that if an unbelieving partner separates, you're, you are no longer married to them. It's dissolved the marriage. That's the Roman Catholic position. They believe that if an unbeliever leaves you because you're a Christian, it dissolves the marriage. I think that's just uh, really not true. I think it's actually kind of ridiculous. I think that you're on sure ground of Matthew 19, 9 than you are here because it just goes against the whole logic of what Paul's just been saying. He's he's, he's saying, yeah, don't divorce even if they're an unbeliever. So because yeah. they made holy. So he's not saying there's some sort of different ontological situation if you're married to an unbeliever. Um, but what does he mean then? And what are you not enslaved to? I think you're not enslaved to the commandment he's just given, which yeah. is don't separate he's basically Mm -hmm. just saying if they leave you let them leave you're not enslaved to having to fix the marriage just let them go that's why he then says god's called you to peace it'll be an interesting it'll be a bit of an odd thing for paul to mention god's called you to peace if he's saying oh you can divorce and and remarry Mm -hmm. no no he's just saying look you're an unbeliever we don't want to create scandal for the church if they want to go let them go because if you're going to yeah. try and drag them through, say, take me back, blah, 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 you, you know, it's going to lead to a lot of drama. Just let them go. But notice he doesn't say you can remarry at all. He yeah. just doesn't say it. So people like Roman Catholics who want to say you can remarry, they're actually reading that into the text. They're bringing that in there. N- then verse 16, straight after, he says, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In, sc- in such cases, the brother sister is not enslaved. He then says, for how do you know wife, whether you'll save your husband, or how do you know husband, whether you'll save your wife, thus showing they're actually still married. Mm-hmm. Very importantly, though, in verse 39, later on in the passage, Paul says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, but only in the Lord. So there we see unequivocally that uh, spouses are bound together as long as they live. It's only dissolved by death. If in verse 15, he's now saying that actually an unbelieving partner merely leaving you dissolves the marriage, then he'd be contradicting himself. Unless you say that it's different, a different sort of type of marriage, one is unbeliever, but verse 14 already ruled that out. And notice that he says in verse 39, you're bound together as long as you live. Verse 15, he says you're not enslaved. Those are two different words. Some English translations actually ob- obfuscate this and they actually have to be the same. They In verse 15, they say in such cases, a brother or sister is not bound. That's terrible. <laughs> I really don't like it when they do that because now it looks like he's giving an exception to what he says in verse 39. He's not. Yeah. It's a different word. The bound is obviously referring to this spiritual mystical union that exists between a married couple. Enslaved is just about you're not enslaved to the commandment I've been giving you, or you're not ensla- you're not obligated to try and to try and keep them with you. So, uh, yeah, there we have it. There, clearly, what's going on is yeah, marriage is indissoluble. Oh, it's only dissolved by death. Therefore, don't divorce, and therefore, don't remarry. Certainly. So yeah, that's. I think that's a pretty thorough treatment of the of the issue. I think. Um, Again, Jack Shannon goes into like all the different councils in church history that that went that read it this way, all the different fathers who read it this way. Um, it's an interesting issue, I think, because we don't we don't see it as an as an uh, effect, a consequence of theological liberalism, because there are, uh, you know, allegedly orthodox uh, or very conservative uh, denominations like the Presbyterians or the Lutherans or even the Eastern Orthodox, and then like we said here, we would differ with Roman Catholics who have bended on this. I believe the Westminster Confession of Faith mm-hmm. accepts an exception. Um, the Lutheran position is um, uh, that adultery is an exception if, if your other spouse yeah. uh, is an adulterer. And I believe the Eastern Orthodox allow for three 
three divorces or something. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I think I think they don't let you get to three. You can have okay. two, maybe. You can have but two divorces. I've heard three. I've heard varying accounts from yeah. Eastern Orthodox people on this, and they often get a bit uneasy about talking about it because, yeah. But mm. we can talk about that as well. Yeah. The history of it all. Yeah, and I would say even even though on paper the Roman Catholic position is probably the closest to the Anglican position. In practice, if anyone lives in a majority Roman Catholic area, I know families who have five kids who have gotten annulments. And it's like, oh, yeah, very common. You yeah, know, yeah. so so in practice, it's not even being really applied in, in a strict sense anymore. Um, I think that we should still rejoice in, in the fact that they are, you know, although they do mistakenly have that view of First Corinthians 10, 15, it is good that they do teach uh mm -hmm. that marriage is indissoluble but yeah it is also their practice does sort of undermine that but it's it's still good anyway um yeah so so what what's the history of the anglican position on this briefly you know some people might be surprised to even hear oh anglicans aren't you guys isn't it all the whole reason your religion exists is for divorce but yeah, yeah, yeah. um <laughs> you know the, the actual history of the situation is a little bit a little bit more um sure on. yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll very quickly uh, explain what happened before the, the English Reformation. Uh, for the first 300, 400 years of Christianity, everyone believed in the permanent view of marriage that you, can, and you can't remarry after divorce. Then in the East, it starts that this view starts to crop up that you actually, you know, maybe you can remarry in some instances and that sort of thing. Uh, the way that I interpret all of that is I think it's quite clear that that starts happening when bishops start becoming very sort of, you know, much part of like the the aristocracy. That's sort of an anachronistic term, but they, they start becoming more popular, more mainstream figures. You know, the church is becoming more mainstream. And, you know, you might have it's often the affluent people who want to divorce and remarry. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so they're maybe they're bending the rules a little bit, but there's also a lot of cynicism. And if you look at their justification for allowing remarriage, it's often statements like, well, yeah, maybe it's best if they didn't remarry, but that's better than the alternative. Uh, you know, you know, maybe we'll just let them remarry rather than they do something worse. Yeah. And sometimes they'll actually say you can remarry if you divorce your wife, but there's a period of penance you have to go through like you sort of almost have to like pay off what you've done you know you, you're 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 banned from communion for a certain amount of time yeah and i just don't really agree with that whole way of seeing things really and mm -hmm. i i think that if you've committed adultery um going through some sort of period of penance but then it's okay i don't think that absolves you at all i i think that you need to repent by turning away from your sin not like paying off your debt yeah. you, we're starting to see this what's going to lead to the reformation, you know, the sort of weird yeah. mindset. Um, so that, that happens in the East and, but then the, the West remained strong on this issue. Well, there were, I think there were one or two people in the West who, who thought you could remarry after adultery and that sort of thing. But, but the, the Catholic church in the West in terms of canon law and things, yeah, you can't remarry. And so then you have the English reformation. Now people, yeah, often bring this up, Roman Catholics will say, well, you have the permanent view of marriage, but, you know, lol, Henry VIII divorced and remarried. First of all, I'll just say, just offhand, I don't, it really infuriates me when this happens, and it always happens. Almost every time I've publicly talked uh, about the permanent view of marriage, I've had Roman Catholics make this uh, joke and things. Whatever happened to, like, rejoicing in, in the truth, you know, like, love... Yeah love is rejoicing in the truth like R roman catholics should be happy that we are agreeing with them on this really important point of doctrine that yeah. almost the whole world disagrees with them on and we're actually saying no you, you guys are right about this and we want to encourage people to remain faithful to their partners and and they're turning into some sort of like gotcha joke it's really i really don't like that and i just bring that because often the the youtube internet apologetics scene can can lead to this really weird stuff like that and that's why earlier i wanted to say hey we should still uh praise the roman catholics mm. for having good teachings on this just because i think it's important that we still you know we're still um this whole thing isn't about a gotcha contest yeah. between denominations but anyway so what happened with henry 8 very quickly he did not divorce any of his wives actually uh his 
his first wife, he annulled the marriage of her, did not divorce her. He annulled the marriage of her because she was actually his brother's wife. His brother married her. It was a marriage of political convenience. And she she did actually bear his brother children, but then, then he died. Now, in the Leverite marriage, right, you can you're you're only supposed to marry your brother's wife if she didn't have kids. So you're supposed to like allow her to have kids. She already had kids to Henry VIII's brother's uh, brother. But what happened was, and, and so under canon law, he should never have married Henry VIII under Roman Catholic canon law. But the Pope made an allowance for it, allowed Henry VIII, I think he was 13 years old, to marry her mm. out of, again, political convenience. Now, the Pope happened to be uh, very connected to both these families, and he mm. it was very much in his interest to have this marriage happen too. So it was very, it was, the whole thing's very political. Pope looks the other way, allows this non-canonical thing to happen. Henry VIII famously wasn't able to have a son, and he thought that he was under God's curse. And he started to think, I should never have married this woman in the first place. And so he asked for an annulment, which actually under canon law should have been granted. Mm. And, and certainly today, the Roman Catholic Church would have granted an annulment on that grounds without hesitation. They grant annulments for you know very silly things. They certainly would have mm. granted this. The Pope didn't give him the annulment because the Pope would have been in serious political danger, actually, mm -hmm. if he had, because he would have upset the the family of, of Henry VIII's wife. Yeah. Uh, but then the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, grants the annulment, allowing him to then annul the marriage and then marry Anne Boleyn. So that's what goes on. He doesn't divorce her. Yeah. Um, but even if he did, it doesn't really change. Like, so what? I, yeah. I don't really care for Henry VIII anyway. And he like, you know, it was because of him that William Tyndale got burned at the stake. He persecuted yeah. Protestants. I don't mm -hmm. see him as being an Anglican in any real sense. It's just. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I so actually just then... did a video on, on Henry VIII. Not even, it's not even his schism that is the current schism that exists between mm. the communion and the Roman Catholic communion. Because Mary, his daughter, yeah. re you know, fixes it in their yeah. theory yeah. and returns to Roman Catholicism. It's Elizabeth mm. who is the a monarch when that happens, and there are, it's a more complicated issue. You can't really, in my opinion, trace. Yeah, that's it. right. And yeah, and he only he only splits from the Catholic Church over all this political stuff. It's, it's yeah. Elizabeth the first who, like, yeah, as you said, decisively breaks it from for yeah. uh, religious you know, theological reasons, among other things as well. Yes. Okay, so then with then Henry VIII dies, Edward VI comes into power, his son, and Thomas Cramner is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, Thomas Cramner believed, as the Continental Reformers did, that you could remarry after, after adultery. And he tries to change the canon laws to therefore allow remarriage after adultery. It never, it never goes through. It never passes through convocation. Um, then... Yeah, Elizabeth I comes back into power after the reign of Mary, and then the old, the old canon law that that the Church of England had had for, you know, centuries when it was Catholic. I mean, you know, I mean, uppercase C Catholic. Yeah, you know, everyone gets so <laughs> upset about that word. Um, uh, it goes back to saying, yeah, uh, you, you can't remarry after divorce. And then that also gets reiterated in 1604 and the 1604 canons. Yeah, you can't remarry after divorce. Very importantly, though, very importantly to understand where everything went wrong. Um, this is also state law. So in uh, it's very hard for us Western uh, moderners to understand, especially if, if you're an American audience to sort of grasp this. But because the Church of England is a state church, it's the actually it's the ecclesiastical courts that decide uh, marital cases. So mm -hmm. the secular law of the land, like so, regardless of what the church might say, can I just divorce and remarriage? You know, remarry outside of the Church of England? No, it's actually all subsumed under the Church of England. So no one in England, even if you don't go to church, can divorce and remarry. It's, it's that's the law of the land. Mm -hmm. um, although you can divorce for adultery. If you get a divorce, though, you actually have to go to Parliament. And remember, Parliament in Parliament is you've got, you know, everyone there is like a Christian. Uh, 
parliament actually has to grant you a specific bill to, to you to allow you to re, to uh, sorry to to divorce if you can prove that it's for a valid reason, but you can never remarry. Now, um, I'm just pulling up some of my notes I wrote. I can't remember the exact number, but we know ex- we know how many divorces Parliament did grant. Um, hmm. Let's have a little look here. Da-da-da. Um, here we go. So from 1552 until 1857, only 317 divorces were granted in England. So that's mm. over a period of 300 years, only 317 divorces. So about, about one divorce is granted by parliament per year. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but again, you can't remarry. So that's that situation. And then as the Church of England you know, spreads across the globe through uh, missionary efforts, you have what eventually becomes like the Anglican communion uh, gets formed. And this position, you can't remarry, is the assumed position of Anglicans because it was taught by many great Anglican theologians. It was defended by the Anglican theologians against the Puritans, against the Mm -hmm. continental Protestants. So it was understood very much to be the Anglican position on the matter. Um, And even in the 19th century, many great, very important works defending marital permanence were written by key Anglican bishops and priests. Mm -hmm. So where do things start to fall apart? Well, it actually starts in the USA Mm -hmm. where the the Episcopal Church, they they sort of want to uh, distance themselves a little bit from the Church of England, especially after the uh, American Revolution. And the in the USA, the USA secular laws were very liberal. It's you know, important to remember that you know America is sort of seen in well, southern states of America is sort of seen as like a conservative part of the world. But America was a liberal, a liberal place. Uh, the American Revolution, they cast off monarchy, big separation of church and state, all this sort of thing. This is liberal ideas, and they had very liberal divorce laws. Uh, I haven't been able to verify this, but I, I have heard that they may well have been the most liberal divorce laws in in the Western world. And that no doubt influenced the Episcop- Episcopalians in the USA. And so in 1860, what is it? Looking at my notes here. In 1868, uh, the General Convention of the Episcopal Church passes a resolution saying that, well, a canon actually passes a canon that, that clergy can remarry lay people who are the, who divorced for the cause of adultery if they're the innocent party. So that's 1868, where that now changes for the USA. What's interesting, though, is that in the Episcopal Church General Convention, you have the, the house of laity, lay people, and then the house of clergy. And the House of Clergy almost unanimously believed in the, in the marital permanence position. They kept getting outvoted by the House of Laity. I wonder why. <laughs> why are the lay people trying to allow them to uh, allow themselves to remarry? And you brought and, this up earlier, actually. But I think the fact that in the in the United States specifically, the Episcopal Church has been overwhelmingly wealthy. Like mm. the people were very affluent. Like because yes. in a state where it's the established church, there's going to be more economic diversity than I think historically would have represented the Episcopal Church. So that's an important lay- point. Yeah. 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 In all marriage statistics, the more wealthy you are, the, the more likely you are to divorce and remarry. Now, what, it, what happens after 1868 is you basically have about 100 years of consistent debate in general convention where the House of Clergy keeps saying, can we can we actually take that back? Can we go back to marital, marital permanence? And they just it just keeps getting thrown out, thrown out, thrown out. Uh, and then eventually when you get into the 70s, they just go full blown. You can divorce and remarry for whatever reason, how many times you want. Uh, and that happens in the 70s. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Episcopal Church went very liberal, very quickly uh, com- compared to other parts of the Anglican communion. Uh, there's a number of reasons why that was. But so that's, that's sort of the sordid tale of of mm-hmm. the of how it was in the States. You basically had like a buffer, a, a hundred years buffer period where it was just you can divorce uh, for adultery and then remarry. And then to what it is now where it's just 
carte blanche, you can, you know, yeah. be married for whatever. So yeah. as for England, uh, do you want me to keep going with this? Because uh, this might be an information overload, but yeah. <laughs> no, I think this is great. And I, I want to talk about England too, because some people may know this, some people may not know this. You know, it was it was very staunchly the position of the Church of England until the modern era. There was, and mm -hmm. there were no exceptions. Like uh, we talked before, we started recording with Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson. He had to yeah. step down from being king because he wanted yeah. to marry a divorcee, which would have meant that he would have had to leave the Church of England, which would have meant that he couldn't be king of England. That's right. right. Yeah. And of course, you know, King Charles, um, when he was Prince Charles, he wasn't allowed to marry Camilla in the Church of England uh, because, uh, you know, in their eyes, he was still married to Princess Diana. So that's yeah. why he had to marry Camilla in the um, in the Pres uh, in the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian yeah. Church. Little, he found a little legal loophole <laughs> there where he could do that because because he's because yeah. he's yeah. So what happened in England? Well. First of all, it's important for people to know this. Uh, we often, when we think the 1800s, we think the Victorian era, we think everyone is like this fuddy-duddy conservative. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you're not allowed to show your ankles and that sort of thing. <laughs> that is not true. The Victorians were liberal people. All these liberal ideas we have now, the, a lot of that was very popular then, and a lot of people are shocked to find just how liberal the Victorians were. It was crazy. Uh, you actually, you know, the, the whole free love movement, you think, you know, mm -hmm. 1960s free love that starts in the 1800s. Yeah. You know, you have, um, in Lord the Byron. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You, you've got, you've got, you know, Darwinism being formed. Atheism is mm -hmm. very popular. The French revolution just happened in 1799. We had this, you know, brutal persecution of Christianity, the rejection of social norms. You've got the Russian revolution is in the distance it's it's you know it's the, the what leads to that is in full swing you got the communist manifestos published you've got you know people like robert owen william blake william godwin mary gov uh, nichols they they are all saying that marriage is this repressive institution that should be abolished free love movement uh people like herbert spencer havelock ellis thomas davidson you know and like Mary Shelley and her husband, Percy Shelley, had an open marriage. The aristocracy was notorious for all their sexual es yeah. escapades. You've already brought up Lord Byron with, you know, all his well-publicized uh, mm -hmm. extramarital affairs. This is it's, it's this liberal social environment. Yeah. And that's why in 1857, the the law of the land is changes. So so uh, it's no longer under the church's jurisdiction to to uh look at marriage uh cases it's now secular secularized in 1857 and you can remarry if you divorce your spouse for adultery now once that changes there in 1857 because because the church of england is this state church it that will influence the people in the church of england Mm -hmm. And unlike America, where you've got like the clergy have the parents view, the laity have have the liberal view. What happens in England is you've got the bishops who are in the House of Lords. You know, they're part of the aristocracy. If you're a bishop, mm -hmm. they are pushing to have the law of the land and the Church of England's laws be the same. Uh, so they want the Church of England to allow you to remarry after adultery because they are worried that they're now becoming out of touch that people are going to see the Church of England as back, you know, backwards, and that they want to be up with the times. This is the bishops, the aristoc aristocratic bishops. Mm -hmm. But it's the it's the regular clergymen, these priests who are, who are staunchly saying, no, 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 no. They all believe in the, in the marital permanence view, and you have all these great clergymen writing books after books of the books, articles being published defending the permanence view of marriage. And for 100 years in England, you have fierce, fierce debate over this issue and it's almost depressing now because if you, know, you talk to most anglicans now and if you say you believe that you can't ever remarry if you divorce then people sometimes look at you like you're some sort of freak like they've never even heard this idea before well not only was this what the anglican church taught for centuries but if you were alive in the mid 1800s to the early uh, 1900s you would have known all about this issue because it was so fiercely debated for like 100 years it was like the homosexuality thing it was like the mm. 
hot button issue that just kept being debated. And people with our position kept winning, 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 winning. Every time it just came up, no, they'd say, oh, you got to have marriage opponent's view. But when once it lost, it just all fell apart very quickly. And, and, and yeah. that's uh, the sad thing. So where it starts, it, it, it goes wrong as things usually do in, um, in the eighties, <laughs> uh, in in the 1980s, the church of England passed a resolution, not a canon by the way. So, so a resolution is sort of like stating, it's almost like stating an opinion. Mm-hmm. They passed a resolution that, and it was very vague that there are, there are actually instances where you can, uh, remarry under what they call exceptional circumstances but the canons don't change. But then in, in 2002, the church of England then does allow remarriage after divorce. Uh, and, and so that's kind of what happened there. Um, after that eighties resolution, it kind of just moves in that liberal direction. And basically the, the truth of what happened there is the conservatives died. Like they literally died like yeah. of old age and the yeah. new generations who are coming in, you know, people who have, People who like the the old guard were have been alive for decades before the sexual revolution. These are people who were born after the sexual revolution coming yeah. in. They've always known a world where uh, marriage is seen as being dissolable. You know, they might be the children of uh, parents on their second marriage, and that's sort of, these are the, the new blood coming in, and that's why very it just after a hundred years of staunch, fierce debate, uh, it all just falls apart very quickly. And that's, I think a lot of it's because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you touched briefly on how this relates to the homosexuality debate, or at least you made an analogy. Like it's very similar. It was very similar at the mm-hmm. time. Something that I think really struck a chord with me is I, I, I almost think we lose the debate around marriage in the culture because we conceded in large part all of this stuff about divorce and remarriage mm. because think about the arguments they're in that they're almost exactly the same with why you should allow someone to remarry after divorce they'll say mm. well should this person be celibate their whole life just because of this this it's this problem in their life and it's like well you know actually if you read matthew 19 right after that jesus and people say this is such a harsh teaching how can we follow it and to some people are made eunuchs some people have to be celibate mm-hmm. Paul brings up yeah. celibacy so it's it's i think to to some extent that the 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 advocates for homosexual marriage are right to call lots of conservative christians hypocrites because mm-hmm. they don't feel this way they wouldn't call someone to celibacy in the issue of divorce and remarriage they would say yeah that's true you know tough situation i guess you can get remarried because what are you supposed to do be celibate um and i think we just concede that ground we we concede the ground about what marriage even is and then it's like well are you really going to be able to have this argument about who can get married and how many people can get married with each other yeah no you're absolutely right and i remember very clearly the first time a liberal uh christian made this argument where they said um they were defending the lgbt stuff Mm. and then i was opposing it and, and based on the bible and they said well but i've never heard you care about people getting divorced and remarried which the which the New Testament is just as clear about, and it did take me back. I thought, mm, that's yeah. a good point. That's a good mm-hmm. point. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so, you know, it, they are right to call conservatives hypocrites for not caring about this. More than that, I think this would offend a lot of people. I think they're right to say that there are actually. I think we have to be honest. There are lots of conservative Christians who are homophobes. They are homophobic, and what I mean by homophobe is they obviously just have some sort of weird psychological. Uh, repulsion at mm. homosexuality and and that's really what's sort of uh motivating their views rather than an actual like uh rational sort of biblical view where yeah. um I'll, I'll give an example i had a guy who's divorced and remarried come up to me he, he knows about my position and he wanted to talk to me about it he wanted to know why i think that he should be celibate i said well you know Remarriage is adultery. And like you said, yeah, Jesus says that some have to make themselves eunuchs of the kingdom of heaven. He says that right after saying remarriage is adultery. So clearly that would be saying that you have to be celibate in order to repent of this sin. 
And, uh, you know, he sort of just made this argument of how that's impossible. You know, that's, that's so much, that's so, such a hard ask. That's blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you would say the same thing to gay people, wouldn't you? And he said, well, gay people can't be Christian. <laughs> and <laughs> now it's it's true that unrepentant, you know, homosexuals, uh, you know, are a serious sin and, and probably can call themselves Christians, but but he um, he almost sort of seemed to be saying that even someone who has same sex attraction and is is celibate, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like it's, it's, not, it's not even something he cares about at all. And I think that's I, I just thought there it is. There's mm -hmm. the reality of it because um, yeah. it is ridiculous that you know I I know uh, gay people who when I, when I say gay people I mean they they have same sex attraction. It's very clear they do, and they have for you know since they were little kids really it's, it's and you, ever, little kids they're always effeminate and you know flamboyant mm -hmm. that sort of way and they're gonna they're gonna be celibate yeah um and and so they should and they should they shouldn't they should resist their urges yeah. why why is that fine but all of a sudden if they're if they're straight if they're heterosexual mm -hmm. all of a sudden oh that's ridiculous that's ludicrous to expect me to be celibate well yeah. you know a hundred percent for sure but also yeah. what you said where if you if you can see the ground here you can you actually inevitably concede the ground on the homosexuality thing yes because mm -hmm. really the problem here is you have people who don't see marriage as being uh you, we can even call it a sacrament i mean you know i'm i'm a like reformed anglican but i i don't really care about debate about words and all this stuff yeah. like how many sacraments i just don't really you know whatever. Yeah. like it's like the word catholic you know yeah, marriage is a sacrament in a way. Yeah, sure. And in fact, the word sacrament, when it shows up one time in the New Testament, is referring to marriage and the homily is called marriage a sacrament. Mm -hmm. So, so long as when you say sacrament, you don't mean it's sort of like some sort of necessary for salvation. Sacrament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no one thinks that anyway. So, yeah. Anyway, so um, people don't see marriage as a sacrament or don't see it as this mystical God ordained union. And that's the, that's really the problem. And you are inevitably going to lead to that view if you concede this ground. Because what we're saying here is, as Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So what he's saying is that marriage is divinely instituted. It's instituted by God. God decides who's married and who's not, not man. It's not ruled by man. And so God has said that one man and one woman, are, uh, that's what a marriage is. So no polygamy, no homosexuality, one man, one woman. And he's also said that they cannot separate what he's mystically united. Yeah. And uh, how they're mystically united is through vows, which are binding. The scriptures are clear that vows are binding on you. But mm -hmm. vows that are then consummated through the sexual union, which is a mystical thing that is almost like the handshake that seals the deal. Yeah. And, and that's what God said. Now, if you're actually going to say that, no, man can separate what God's joined together. Man, I, I just give my wife a piece of paper from a judge saying you're divorced, then our marriage is done. Now we're saying that marriage is actually an invention of man. Man mm -hmm. gets to decide who to marry, when to divorce, blah, blah, blah. It's basically just a contract. And once you have that position, well, why can't two men just get married if, it, if the whole thing's man-made? Uh, because you see what's going, you're, you're yeah. taking marriage as, and it, it, it's so apt that what happened in the church of England started with, uh, marital laws being taken away from the church and given mm -hmm. to it, to a secular court. Cause that's what's going on is marriage is being taken away from God and given over to autonomous man. That's the yeah. problem. And when you do that with, with divorce and remarriage, you're going to, you will lead to the homosexuality issue and then, and then polygamy after that as well. Because I believe, you know, unless the world ends in 20 years or something, I believe that um, uh, we, we it likely will be a scenario where in like the Episcopal Church, you have like a gay bishop who's like yeah. gay, you married to a man. He'll be considered a conservative. Because yes. like, no, marriage should be between two people. <laughs> you already see that in the Episcopal Church today because they yeah. are debating polygamy. And there are people like, yeah. well, obviously that's too far. It's like, well, why is it obviously too far? What's the positive view that you that is that you're putting forth that we have to strive towards instead of just conceding new limits every 10 years about what fine yeah that's not ideal but we'll allow mm -hmm. uh, fine that's not ideal but we'll allow it 
I, I think yeah. that it's an untenable position. And I think something that is interesting is the, the only hesitance I actually have about considering marriage like a full, like a sacrament in a, in a real sense, the label, you're right, is fine, it's whatever, is that it's actually not something even unique to the church in the way that the other sacraments are. Something that's distinguished the Christian view of marriage as well is it is a right that we recognize from outside of the church. And those right. marriages are also indissolubable. So you don't actually technically like if you follow the marriage right and the liturgy or whatever, we're just recognizing a, a, something that happens legally in a society. Yeah. So Paul never you know, goes out of his way and says, well, you didn't understand what marriage was supposed to be when you were a pagan. It doesn't count now, which is something I see a lot is people will say, oh, but I didn't know what I was getting into. You know, I didn't know this person that well. All these other reasons, like if I had known this and other thing. And I can have sympathy for 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 people who are really struggling in marriages with somebody that they really didn't think that they knew. But like th that's that's there are people who had no they didn't have Genesis 224 and they're still held accountable to that view of marriage. It's considered an obvious fact of natural theology, in, in my opinion, yeah. at that point. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. People, um, I, I often get messages on Facebook from from strangers. Who, you know, they've, they've heard about my views and they want to say, "Well, I didn't know." Well, you know, uh, Isaac blesses Jacob, thinking he's Esau, and he can't take his blessing back. Yeah, um, Joshua exactly, makes yeah. a vow to the Gibeonites, uh, thinking like they deceive him. He thinks they're from somewhere else. And he, he says, I can't take the vow back. I'll be mm -hmm. under God's wrath. Very interestingly, that because God told him to actually wipe them out. And now he's yeah. actually having to uh, save them. Obviously, will anger God. God respects the vow, the binding yeah. vow. Uh, you know, there's there's many such cases, right? The, the vows <laughs> are, are binding. And it's it's that's just reality. People just have to accept reality. It's like, you know, you you have sex with some stranger and now you're pregnant. Uh, well, I didn't know. I, uh, well, too bad. Like that's just reality. You sometimes <laughs> you have to live with uh, consequences. Yeah. We we don't believe in a world where everything can just sort of be erased. And uh, you know, no, we believe in a world uh, of of concrete reality that can't be erased. And so, and that's the same with vows. Yes, uh, that they have a permanent spiritual effect. Yeah, yeah. And and I actually even think the the badness of divorce is so clear like it's just been horrible for our society like mm. even completely secular you know not to get too personal but in my life my my parents are divorced okay they mm. were actually not even their first marriages so who knows you know what the situation is but one of the things that was so obvious to me about r religion when i was an atheist growing up in that context was wow these people take marriage seriously mm. this is a, a problem in our society things like fatherlessness the destruction of the family is is obvious i think even to people completely outside the church so it's almost in my opinion an evangelical burden that we actually have to accept otherwise we lose the 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 witness that we would otherwise have to a society that is is being destroyed by this particular sin and if we concede it then it we lose that 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 evangelical um, ability to say to the society we actually god gave us this clear rule that actually is way better than the way that you are doing life yeah um, and it's superior to the to the wisdom of the world um yeah yeah and, and maybe we can get into unless you have any thoughts on that maybe we can get into like p practical like how would this play out in some people's lives sure um, yeah but... yeah just one little note there is uh, i made a facebook post about this recently <laughs> um yeah you're right and so it is I, I i called out a bishop for doing this um mm -hmm. i think he he's the chairman of uh gosh I can't forward and faith name. i think yeah forward and faith he was the chairman of forward and faith in in the church of england this is, this is like the big um conservative group in the church of england to defend the traditional view of marriage which which means that marriage be a man and woman which obviously i agree with like mm. in case people accuse me of not believing that or something but i said i said the guy's a hypocrite because while he was while he was the chairman he divorced his wife and one year later remarried uh yeah. but he's the chairman he's the champion of traditional marriage yeah. and yeah. uh 
it's a real problem because our message to the world should be we believe in the sanctity of marriage we believe in the power of marriage we respect marriage but if you're going to say i can divorce my wife and remarry willy-nilly or whatever you are not doing that and your message to the world now is actually just that we just think that marriage is, is just between a man and a woman but even that shouldn't be respected that much and so that's going to come across as you just being arbitrary and homophobic as well now yeah. i i don't want to be too pragmatic i'm just i'm, I'm not saying that oh, that's the if, only reason. if it offends the liberals or well, therefore it must be wrong but it is still true that th this yeah. is part of this whole situation that we've actually got into this mess if we were consistent about this from the start i think that people would have respected us yeah. um you know, I, I'm friends of a number of liberals and atheists and, and gay people, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I'm a very strongly opinionated conservative person and none of them are really offended by me because because I try and be consistent all the time. Yeah. It's people who are inconsistent. It's these it's conservative Christians who are inconsistent, who go on and on and on about how much and rightly so they yeah. don't believe in gay marriage, but they're on their third marriage. It's these mm -hmm. people that have put us into this really um, awkward spot yeah. as, as a society. And so um, that it's when I noticed that sort of thing, that's when I started to, to, to think that I want to go after conservatives more like mm -hmm. the liberals should, we should go after them too, but people are already doing that. I yeah. think we need more people to push back against conservative hypocrisy, which is yeah. very common. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah. I think couldn't agree more. Let's start with some practical hypotheticals because some people will say, you know, what if somebody was not a Christian, were married once, got a secular divorce, got remarried again, and then this person that they're married to is a Christian, they have children even, and say they didn't have children in their first marriage. You know, it's a complicated situation. Are you really going to tell the second person that their first marriage is the legitimate one and that the second marriage is the illegitimate one. What would you do? Yeah. What would, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, my blanket rule that I, that I would have for all cases is you have to be celibate. So I wouldn't budge on that one. So if, if you, um, if you're divorced and remarried, you have to be celibate uh, period. Not going to change my mind on that. Uh, well, mm -hmm. like as an, but that's just always going to be the case. I think that because of, yeah, in Matthew 19, when Jesus says, whoever divorces and remarries commits adultery, uh, some have to make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. I think it's pretty clear what he's saying there. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul says, if you do divorce, you, ha you have to remain unmarried. Um, and then earlier on, he said that married couples should have sex to avoid the temptation to sin. I said this is a concession, not a command. Well, if you've gone and violated Jesus and Paul's commandments and gone and remarried, I think that it's fair to say that this concession is no longer <laughs> given to you, right? If, um, yeah. Because sex and marriage as well is a privilege, not a right. And people will try and act like marriage is some sort of right that you have. That's why you, you hear about like, you know, gay rights, marital rights. You don't have the right to marry. Uh, mm. uh, it's just, no, it's a privilege that you have. And so uh, I think that if you are, if you've committed adultery, I think it's pretty fair to say that that privilege is no longer, has no longer been given to you. Paul only says that you should be having sex as a couple. I mean, I think there are other reasons you should be having sex as a couple, but the main reason Paul gives, and even in the book of Comprea and the marriage uh, thing, it's, it's to avoid worse sin well mm -hmm. if if having sex with them is sin anyway because it's adultery <laughs> then obviously that doesn't apply so i think yeah you have to be celibate i think another little issue here by the way in the protestant world is us um forgetting the value of celibacy and mm -hmm. i think that that's a real problem and i i, I kind of do in many ways align myself with this uh, reformed you know kind of like christian nationalist very conservative, reformed kind of grouping of, of people. Um, I think that they've got a lot of great stuff and cultural engagement and things, but they have a lot of problems as well, which I'm seeing. I'm, I'm starting to realize a lot of these guys, um, when I came out as believing in the permanency of marriage, they got really, ag some of them got really aggro and you can start to say, oh, okay, um, there are some issues here. Yeah. And one of the issues, sorry? 
they might have some idols about this issue. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think one of their issues is um, they do go on about marriage probably a little too much. And this is like a bit of a hot topic because mm -hmm. they will, uh, you know, we're talking about people like Douglas Wilson and Michael Foster and, and uh, these, these sorts of, uh, these sorts of guys. Uh, they will go after people um, like, like Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller, who, who would say that you, you know, marriage can be an idol and that sort of thing. And they'll say, you, you never should have, like you went us down, you took us down a, a, a bad path there because we should actually be telling people that marriage is a good thing that you should aspire to. And they'll say things like singleness is not a gift. Celibacy, you know, might be a gift, but singleness isn't. And, and they're very much about pro-marriage. It's, it's a sort of trad thing, right? It's all about having a trad wife, being a trad husband on a ranch with, you know a million kids and things and like i'm i'm cool with all that i'm i'm i yeah. consider myself to basically be a trad mm -hmm. although it's a bit of a meme turn now and everything but there <laughs> is a little problem here which i have which is very noticeable which is what about the fact that the bible is really clear that celibacy is actually the the like peak like that mm -hmm. that celibacy is actually superior to marriage and if we want to talk about being trad Name me one church father who thought that marriage was uh, better than celibacy. Yeah, they all thought that celibacy was like the pinnacle. Yeah. Um, and I think when we start to downplay celibacy and that sort of thing, it, you know, if if you've got a church where someone is forty and single, no kids, and people are thinking, "Where are your ten kids?" and he's like, mm -hmm. "I'm celibate," and they start to think. Yeah, they might be like, I think he's gay. <laughs> or something. Um, yeah. When you have that kind of environment, that actually can be bad on this issue because now you're leading people to have this wrong mindset where they think celibacy, I can't think of anything worse. That That's like yeah. a death sentence. No, we need to be um, saying celibacy is actually good if you can, if you can handle it. Um, mm. You know, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I that's another thing. If people go celibacy is a gift. Only some people should be celibacy if they're the gift of celibacy. I don't agree with that either. No, I think a celibacy is a responsibility for everyone who's not married, yeah. um, and like, until they get married, and it's mm -hmm. also a responsibility for anyone who's, uh, you know, married to someone who's who they're divorced uh, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it. I mean, Paul couldn't. I don't think be more clear than when he says, "I wish that you were all like me," but. It's a butt clause. It's a obviously conceding mm. to the that we, it's not realistic or um, other things. God did give a good way to express this, so it's not saying marriage is bad. Obviously, um, yeah, yeah. But the, and that's actually is a distinguishing trait I would say of Christianity in that attitude towards celibacy that lots of cults deviate from. Uh, Mormonism, I believe. Mm. That you're like you're you get better heaven the more kids you have and if you get married it's like great for you whatever yada yada, yada. yeah there there yeah, are clear, like um you know reasons why leaders of social groups want you to have kids i guess you know mm -hmm. uh for for their betterment of their organization mm -hmm. um uh and that doesn't mean that it is bad if you you know are in a nice marriage and i'm i'm married right and you can have yeah. kids and all that stuff so i'm not saying it's bad but um it, it it's a distinguishing trait of Christianity that we think that that's a perfectly reasonable, if not better alternative to being married as being celibate mm. uh, that we should defend. And I don't, as far as I understand, I don't think Islam, any, of the, any other religions have this, uh, you know, view. In fact, they tend to go all go towards like, you know, men should have as many wives as they can have a bajillion yeah, children yeah. and all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's a very distinctive Christian position is that celibacy is good. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we sort of lost it. And not to mention that Jesus' teachings on the permanence of marriage is one of the most distinctive, unique, yeah. countercultural teachings of Jesus. And it's, it's a bit of a shame that we've kind of lost it in some ways. Yeah. Um, we're kind of diluting the real radical uh, nature of Christianity. Yeah. But back to the partial stuff. So, yes, yeah, celibacy would be a blanket rule. Uh, now, I disagree. You know, it's, it's not a major disagreement. I think it's just a little minor disagreement. But guys like Jack Shannon would say that uh, you should just have to separate if you're remarried. You always would have to separate. I, I just, I think that that would be the ideal, uh, would be that if, if you found yourself, you know, you are remarried, you've, you've been convicted of this issue, what do you do? But I also understand that 
if you've got kids, then things are now quite complicated because I do believe you have an obligation to your kids to raise them properly. And everyone knows, and you know, studies have proven and everything as if we needed any proof, but a mm-hmm. child has to have mom and dad at home. Like you, that's yeah. what you got to have. Um, and I think you have, I do think that if, if you are remarried, you should, you should be celibate, but maybe, uh, and maybe it would be okay for you to still uh, be in the same house as, as, as that person for the kids, for raising the kids together and that sort of thing. That's also the Roman Catholics old school position that they, they would call it a Josephite marriage. So the, the couple becomes celibate. They maybe sleep in separate bedrooms Well, they would sleep in separate bedrooms, but um, they raise the kids together. And mm-hmm. I, I think that would be okay. Um, but people go, well, but, but they're bound to sin. I'm, you know, if they sleep, if, if they're in the same house and they're bound to sleep together or something. Well, yeah, but I don't really think that, oh, it would be so difficult is like, that doesn't really convince me much. Yeah. You know, it's but like saying they weren't, they if might you aren't married. Yeah. If you're single, you should be celibate. People go, well, they're bound to watch pornography or something. It's like, okay, sure. Well, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't really change anything. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, may okay if they really can't hack it. Maybe they should. Maybe they sleep in different houses, or I, I don't know how it would work. It would be case by case. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just saying. I think that I. I think there are some cases where you might be say, okay, maybe you can live together, or in, in, if you don't have kids, I think you. Yeah, you you just have to separate us. You don't have, there's no reason for you to stay together. It's, I'm just talking about if you've got, got kids. Yeah. Yeah. So there, that would be where I, I'd be a bit more flexible. Yeah. And I think that there are, there are maybe more uh, clear entailments of this position. Like say somebody is divorced. They come to a, they're not remarried. They come to a congregation and they realize the biblical doctrine on this. They would then not be seeking marriage uh, anymore. Uh, mm. they, see maybe reach out to their spouse or all these different kinds of things um i mean even though we are kind of there is that pauline pit but basically saying you don't have to reach out um you're not you're not sla- enslaved to them if they're not a believer all these other kinds of things but um yeah sorry i had another question but now i i can't help but <laughs> i had a thought earlier when we were talking mm-hmm. about how i when i first became christian i was really into looking into like uh, you know, the, the critical scholarship on the, the Gospels. And, you know, I had this conception that, oh, I would only follow what like the critical people could trace back to Jesus. And as far yeah. as I could tell, all of the stuff that about his doctrine of divorce, that's like the most certain Jesus teaching yes. even in critical scholarship, because they're like, nobody would make this up, basically. To yeah, yeah for sure. The corpus. Um, yeah, yeah. big, big liberal guys who think that basically half of what Jesus reported saying they don't think he said, they said, no, we could be absolutely certain that he had the parents' view of marriage. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because of how often it shows up. So it, it's not just some like random tertiary uh, Jesus issue, you know, whatever. It's it's very central. Um, mm-hmm. But but maybe back to the to the to the practicals. Do you have any other, um, you know, hard cases that uh, that you think are worth uh, commenting on or? Yeah, like I, I acknowledge, like obviously, I I acknowledge that it's difficult. It would be difficult for someone they had maybe this catastrophic marriage when they're very young to a non-Christian. They get married to a wonderful Christian. They've got kids, and now we're saying no, you're actually still married to that first one. I'm sure that that would come as a real shock to people and be very upsetting. Um, yeah, but you know, um, that doesn't mean that it's not true, and yeah. so. Once again, it can be hypocritical where conservative Christians are very happy to tell hard truths to some people, but not to others. Mm -hmm. And we need to be consistent and say, no, this is what Jesus taught. And Jesus, and the thing is, the disciples right after Jesus' teaching say, if such is the case with marriage, it's better not to be married. And Jesus said, yeah, this is a difficult saying and not all can accept it. Like we Mm -hmm. we know it's tough, but it's still true. Yeah. Um, so I acknowledge it. Yeah. I, I just I would want to reiterate one thing. This often comes up with this discussion of what a marriage is. It would be vows and sexual consummation. Mm. If you were living with someone but you never had like 
vows being made publicly and you you were sleeping with them and stuff i i wouldn't consider that to be a valid marriage and if you in the very rare occurrence where you had like a wedding but you didn't sexually consummate it i i've i've spoken to one person who uh claims anyway that that's what happened well no i, I believe that that's what happened <laughs> um then yeah then it's not a marriage either because it needs to be sexually consummated but that just that's something to to point yeah. out and that in terms of the vows, be an annulment. I think, sorry to be clear that would be in an, like an annulled marriage annulment we'd say we're looking at yeah yeah um, and 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 then one i i'd have to i'm doing more thinking about this now but in terms of what the vows are um <laughs> my my wife has a aunt or something is it her mum's cousin or something we went to her wedding yeah bit of a bit of a odd wedding it was like a lesbian marriage celebrant and everything and the vows were just like i declare that i will be with you as long as i love you and you know what i mean like it, and yeah you have to it's wonder like, what does that mean? is yeah. that a valid marriage because the vows are basically just a joke like the vows are actually almost offensive to, to what marriage is yeah so I think that you could maybe stretch it to say there are some instances where you even had a wedding, but it's not, it's still not legit because the vows were such a joke, uh, you know, potentially, potentially. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to think a bit more about that. Some canon lawyer might say, yeah, but it had the intent of marriage. Even that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but even then in this context, you know, those people who got married and everyone around, they, they're all just liberals who don't, who I think you'd even say that the intent isn't quite there either. The celebrant was probably divorced and remarried. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it's um I think there might be some instances where you'd say, nah, that that, that wasn't, wasn't even a marriage. A legit yeah. marriage. But but I'm not a canon lawyer. Um mm -hmm. I think Protestants could do a bit, a bit of canon law stuff to look to go through some of these cases. Yeah. I I'm just throwing that out there as maybe one other uh, situation, but yeah, I have I have like a passing interest in canon law. I'm in law school too, so I just like looking at right. it. From yeah. from what I understand, and maybe you could you could continue the argument you were already making. Like, you know, in the ancient Roman world, there was divorce, so the mm -hmm. idea that marriage was inherently permanent maybe wasn't even you know a part of all of these cultures, and they would have still recognized those as valid marriages. Um, but you're probably also right that even the, the you know the Romans or you know, random African tribes had a, actually a closer view of what marriage is to the, the very per, peculiar view that modern liberals tend to have, which is contractual. It's actually just a development of English common law contract language that is not inherent to, to the natural law or whatever about what contracts are. And yeah, no, you really make a good point actually them. though, yeah. um, to kind of, go against what i was saying we're yeah. in the greco-roman world if they if they did see marriage as dissoluble but we still would say that they were validly married um so you may yeah so maybe even if the vows aren't sort of teaching marriage marital permanence is still legit it's just yeah. it's just that there are really weird weddings out there like oh yeah polyamorous yeah. couples and stuff that's when you start to i think that's when you're starting to wonder if that was valid but yeah so so this is just i think it's 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 worth touching on the difference between an annulment and a marriage day somebody was married first but the person that they got married to had been previously legitimately married right uh yeah. and so and this might sound complicated but in theory their marriage that they thought they had was their first we would have also said was illegitimate so in that situation would you grant kind of liberty to to remarry or yeah so that's that's an important question the question is is basically actually even if remarriage is adultery which we grant is it still a marriage yeah uh, basically um the, the weird thing is that all of the people who teach marriage marital permanence so i respect all say it is so jack mm -hmm. shannon Vody borkham john piper um andrew das like like all these guys they say, yeah, it actually still is legitimate marriage. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm very much just inclined as someone who who believes that you should sort of, you know, we should submit to authority and that kind of thing. Think, well, there must be like uh, there must be some truth to it if they're all saying that. But I sometimes just wonder, eh, where but where they get that from, 
I think they are probably right. And so what that would mean then by the, would be that, yeah, even if like, yeah, you married someone who was divorced uh, and then that marriage ends, like you divorce them. Can you mm-hmm. now remarry? I'd actually, I'd, I'd, I'd go with probably no. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. It's, it's, that's just, that situation is awful to think about. Yeah. I, um, but um, the, the scriptural basis for that is not as strong. Uh, yeah. It's in the New Testament. It really just hinges on one verse in John 4, where Jesus says to the Samaritan woman of the well, you've had five husbands and the man you're now with is not your husband. So there seems to be this implicit idea that uh, it's, she still had, there was still her husbands maybe, but, but the reason mm-hmm. just a bit flimsy. I mean, that Jesus may have just been saying that cause there's like no other word for him to use. Like, it's just like, yeah, you had five husbands because legally speaking, you had five husbands. That doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus is saying, Oh, in God's eyes, you, you like, I, yeah. I just, yeah. yeah, I think that's kind it of is complicated. And, and then it does the seem like there's, is, yeah. No, you go, you go. I was gonna say, how does this interact with maybe us looking back on Old Testament polygamous marriages, which seem to have been considered like like ontologically yeah. happening, even if they weren't, um, you know, a, a pot like viewed positively. Um, they just did. It does seem like David and Solomon had wives. Solomon even has wives and concubines. So there's like a difference, you know, uh, ontologically maybe, right? Yeah. So so people bring that up as well. That's the main maybe the main one they bring up is like, yeah, well, you know, David had multiple wives. Bathsheba was you know, far from his first wife. Uh, but it's, you know, from her that, he, that he has Solomon mm-hmm. and, you know, so obviously God blessed that line. And therefore, you know, David is, is legitimately married to Bathsheba, even if, even if, uh, it was, she wasn't his first wife. Well, I, well, the text just doesn't say that. So you are reading that into it. It doesn't say, like, nowhere does it say that yeah, Bathsheba was his legitimate wife. It's just, it's just, yeah, you know, you're just reading that in. Um, and secondly, um, you know, the Old Testament, like, you know, I, I believe in biblical inerrancy and everything, right? Uh, like, but um, I'm, I'm flipping young earth creationist, you know, mm-hmm. uh, controversially, but with with the old testament we can't be hinging too much on it because it's clear the old testament you know was a chaotic time you know jesus does say hey yeah moses like a divorce yeah but i say no you can't and he gave mm-hmm. you that commandment because of the hardness of your heart and there's there's other cases too where you know the ceremonial law of the old testament the new testament takes a pretty negative view of more a more negative view than i think people most people be comfortable with um where Paul even says in First Timothy four and Colossians two that some of the ceremonial laws are akin to being demonic, mm-hmm. a whole can of worms which we don't need to get into. But um, it is cl- like, you know, it is clear the Old Testament is a different time for a different yeah. people with hard hearts. Yeah. And so, yeah, in the Old Testament, there's genocide being committed. That should not be happening at all by Christians in the in the New Covenant. It's a different situation. Uh, God yeah. had to work with some very hardened, uh, dumb, <laughs> you know, spiritually depraved people. And yeah. so I just don't think it's. Yeah, I think you're on like not yeah. the best footing. If you're having to go to the Old Testament, polygamous, degenerate kings to. Yeah defend that view i think that you are uh, i don't think that's very firm ground yeah especially and with so marriage where we have yeah no you, you go I was say, especially with marriage where we have jesus saying like the way that marriage was done under the law of moses is is not the perfect way of doing marriage in all of the yeah. um cited passages about uh, divorce. yeah that's right uh however all that being said the main argument would be the whole vows thing. So yeah, Joshua makes this vow to the Gibeonites. He's been deceived, but hey, the vow still binding. So if you vowed to someone that you are going to be their husband and they were divorced. And so it actually was adultery for them to be there at that wedding. Yeah. But you still made the vow. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's when you've got a problem. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I think that you could you could maybe like where I probably would be on this right now. I'm still thinking this one through would be uh, it's not really a legitimate marriage. 
it's it's well, it, it's certainly an illegitimate marriage. It's not really a valid marriage. I mean, like you know, the whole illicit valid sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's almost this third category. It's not. It's not a valid marriage. It's not totally not a marriage. Mm-hmm. It's the sort of third ground where um, it's not really a marriage, but there are these binding vows that you've yeah. made that you're going to be held accountable to. I think that's yeah. probably more where I'd go with it. Yeah. So what what would be then the category for annulments? What like you, we said about uh, possibly there being a uh, you know not consummated marriage or or, or whatnot. Um, you know when when would it be acceptable? Would you say that Henry VIII's annulment, right, that Catherine of Aragon mm-hmm. was legitimate or, or or wasn't, or when would when would annulments be applicable? Well, first of all, there's a bit of a weird thing with that because uh, a classic annulment. Um, uh, classic case where people would grant an annulment would be mistaken identity, right? Like mm-hmm. pretty much everyone who grants annulments would grant it for a mistaken identity. The issue is that, like I've already brought up with Joshua yeah. and the Gibeonites and Isaac with Jacob, it's clear instances of mistaken identity, and God <laughs> doesn't like oh, no, yeah. you're still held accountable to the blessing and yeah. the vow. So I just think sometimes. Um, are we granting too many annulments here? Because the New Testament, the whole, the Old Testament rather, is pretty like pretty strict on that, actually, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what would be some cases of, of of one I'd be very happy to grant would be like you're obviously been f- just totally forced to do it. Like, so yeah. this was not a free, a vow that you made of your own free will. This is definitely mm-hmm. you're forced. Yeah. Um, or you lack the ability to consent. So if you're a child yeah. or you're very mentally um, ill or uh, impaired or something, you know, something like yeah. that, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mistaken identities, again, that's a big one. But I just, you know what I mean? Yeah. With, 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 Joshua, with yeah. Joshua and Jacob, it just, it's a bit uh, interesting there. But maybe, um, sure. Yeah, uh, another one is interesting. Yeah. Oh, Applic- applicable, I imagine, to the Anglican communion. Like, I even remember I went to an Anglican provincial thing, and there was an African bishop who basically was like, "You know, the struggle you guys are having with with gay marriage, with your culture, we're having with polygamy." But mm-hmm. I wish someone had like asked him because I was like, "Wait, how do they deal with like some a polygamous family comes into the church, and they're like, we're Christians, like what?" What what is the conduct there? Do you know? Well, here in New Zealand, when the the missionaries were evangelizing the the native population here, uh, they had to deal with polygamy, and I, I believe their position was they uh, have to have to leave every wife except for their first one. Have to stay with the first mm. one. And I I would probably agree with that. But can those wives remarry? Mm-hmm. again this question is it is it a valid marriage even if yeah. it was wrong is it still a valid marriage yeah i I'd, I'd go back to saying yes this it, it is this third category so the yeah. the wife probably can't remarry uh but the husband her husband her illegitimate husband so to speak is probably obligated to look after her because in these cultures a woman who's you know unmarried is in a bit of trouble so he probably has the obligation to look after her but mm-hmm. yeah, they can't sleep together, and then that sort of thing would be where I'd go with that. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is complex. Incest is another one that people grant annulments for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think, you know, as far as I understand, the BCP. Actually, I actually don't know if I have my sixteen sixty two on me. It has in the back this like list of affinity, and mm-hmm. marriage begets affinity. So like certain marriages, I think is the idea would be illegitimate if say you married your stepmom or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think would have been the traditional view. And yeah. so maybe those would have been an old um, on the grounds of incest. Um, even if they're not biological incest, there's this tradition in canon law that marriage begets affinity. So it would have been, it would have been weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, it is worse with the, the canon law stuff that I don't obviously know as much about mm. um, in terms of, I just haven't thought through, I don't have a legal, I don't have like a lawyer's yeah. men, like mindset. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. You're studying law, which is cool. It'll be, it'll be good to go go through it all thinking like a lawyer thinking like <laughs> yeah you know, 
Well, and, and, and I mean, I think part of that also, though, you could even argue, well, that's just to help for there's literally a part in the marriage ceremony where they ask the congregation, is there any reason these two should not be wed? Um, there might be some things that would be valid to bring up in that moment, like, you know, the Shrek moment where he bursts down the doors, you know, and says, stop, stop, you know. Yeah, it might be applicable in that scenario, but then not retroactively invalidating the marriage and it's and sure. it's annulled you could probably yeah. say that's the purpose of that in the bcp mm. um yeah yeah super interesting uh to talk about and super important to talk about i think in a lot of ways it's kind of the first domino like in a lot of conversations with with conservative especially anglicans they say oh the beginning of the end was like women's ordination which i, which I am against obviously um but in a lot of ways, I think that the, the kind of the seeds that you can notice are actually, uh, you know, divorce and marriage and, and marriage questions, questions about about marriage, where they're really the, the yeah. tension in the fabric um, that that ended up causing the dominoes to, to start with questions of liberalism. Um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Obviously, there were some other like things before then you had higher criticism and people yeah. you know doubting the authenticity of the bible and stuff but in terms of in terms of church policies it was it was as far as i'm aware the first domino really i yeah. think there may have been a few you know minor things before then that probably started to get loosened up but yeah. but yeah that's yeah, that was the first really big one i mean there are other issues that you might disagree with you know, maybe concessions being made to Anglo Catholics and stuff, but there's nothing really like it's none of that's a, a big deal. This is this is the first instance where the church just clearly violated the teachings of Christ, is, yeah. is what I mean. And um, yeah, and then yeah, that led us to here. And of course, yeah, as we've mentioned, Jack Shannon in his his book Contramundum Swagger, yeah, he argues that it's because of this issue that we're under God's judgment. Yeah, not just as a church, but even as a as a as a society, Western society, Western civilization is under his judgment for it. And I, I agree. I, yeah, yeah. we're definitely under God's judgment. I think that's pretty clear by now. And yeah. I, I, I would say, I think the conservatives are clearly under judgment too. So, mm. you know, are you in the ACNA? I, I am. I'm in, I'm yes, I'm in the ACNA. Yeah, so you, similar situation to me in New Zealand. I'm in the the CCA, the Church of Confessing Anglicans, where we left the mainstream Anglican Church, and they kept all the buildings. Yes. Um, and so you know, my church that I planted, we meet in a tennis club uh, hall, and then the church that I go to in the morning, we meet in a in a deaf society hall. And I've got there's other CCA churches that meet in like school gymnasiums and stuff, and all our beautiful, gorgeous stained glass stone buildings yeah. uh you know run by and it's it's always the most the most beautiful buildings are always the most liberal it's oh yeah the total you know they're basically atheists yeah. you know um forget divorce or remarriage these guys are like probably <laughs> polyamorous or whatever yeah and they they've got the beautiful buildings and i think it's pretty clear what that means if you read the scriptures when if if you know, the Gentiles are taking the land off, mm -hmm. off the Israelites and stuff. What does that mean? That means that the Israelites are being punished. Yeah. The, the Canaanites are God's punishment. And I think that's quite obviously what's happened. The, the liberals aren't being punished. You know, yeah. Their numbers are declining and the Episcopal Church will you know, probably die out eventually. But they're yeah. not really being... They're still... They've got a lot of money. They've got the oh, yeah. buildings. They've still got a, a number, uh, quite a lot of prestige. Like all the things that they care about, they still actually really have. It's the conservatives who've had to lose the buildings, lose your pensions, lose your vicarages, uh, yeah. lose sometimes your congregations and that sort of thing. Uh, lose your full stipend. You know, you have to go into yeah. probably like me. I have to uh, work. A secular job after do a tent making job to pay the bills and stuff mm -hmm. that is clearly showing there's the conservatives who god is punishing yeah uh, we're and, in exile i mean it's a very biblical yeah I think, yeah and i think a lot of it's our hypocrisy and and the most the main one would be the divorce and remarriage issue which i consider to be a first order issue a salvation yeah. issue because 
if you're an adulterer, you're going to be damned, as Paul makes really clear. Uh, and then women's ordination after that, which I would say is more second. When I say second order, it doesn't mean it's not important. And I think that women's ordination can damn you. Uh, yeah. But it's not, I don't think it's it's the same. I, I think it's not as important as divorce and remarriage uh, where you're in, ah, maybe, maybe I'd, I could change that and say maybe it is first order women's ordination but it's, I, I don't think it's as important in any, in any case and then there yeah. are other issues too after that that conservatives have fumbled on or been hypocrites about yeah and um yeah so i think we're in trouble we got to repent and turn back to the lord which is which is why i'm happy to keep sort of going after conservatives in a way punching right as people say <laughs> even though I'm, I'm very right wing myself but just yeah yeah I think that's more biblical as well yeah. is um, what do you see Jesus do more? He, he, Jesus isn't really going after as much um, the people who are total just drop out degenerates. He's actually trying to save those people and bring them into the church. The people he's really going after are the people who, who should know better. Yeah. It's, it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's the, it's the people who, who should know better who he's going after. And he actually says this in John nine, where he says, if you, if you were blind, you wouldn't have sin, but it's because you see uh, mm. that you, you know, you'll be condemned. And so it's more important, I think, for us to to say to fellow conservatives, hey, you've got to repent on this issue and get back, than to go after the liberals, because the liberals just aren't gonna listen anyway. In a yeah. way, you can just sort of just leave them to this sin. They're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna <laughs> you're not you're like Gene Robinson, you know, that that the guy yeah. who started the whole thing off, the bishop who married a man. Um, why is he going to become a conservative? This is not going to happen. But yeah. I mean, you can still try. I mean, but you know, it's just it's more important for us to focus on issues that we, as a, as a conservative wing of the church, need to get right. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I completely agree. I think there's a lot of warning about people who are inside false prophets. Maybe it might be a harsh word for it, but I think it's it's can can be in certain situations very appropriate. This idea that you are supposed to be representing the church and even giving doctrine to people, especially if they're shepherds, if they're pastors, they're supposed to be giving correct doctrine to their, to trusting laity and they're, they're leading them astray. And that's, you know, the Bible can be clear about warning against that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and I think this is a, yeah, everything you said is totally true. Big issue. People are ignoring this big issue. Even conservatives are ignoring this issue. It's sad to see that. Um, is there anything yeah. else that you'd want to say on on that we didn't get to touch on as we wrap up? Uh, no, I think I think yeah, I'm, I'm happy with what we all talked about, and yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to maybe maybe I could recommend some books. We got we already mentioned Jack's book. Um, this came out recently: Remarriage and Early Christianity by Andrew Das. I interviewed him on my channel for like two and a half hours or something. Great book goes through the biblical uh, uh, stuff in like really intricate detail goes into the early church as well. We differ on the pastor application, but that's not what the book's about. The, the pastor application is sort of something he talks about right at the end and like the conclusion. The, this is just a great book for arguing that. Yeah. Remarriage is always adultery. There's also the classic book, Jesus and divorce, which came out in the eighties. Uh, this is like this is a really important book in the 80s where you got these two evangelical guys said actually remarriage is always adultery and, and the whole evangelical world it went to this big sort of drama uh, because previous to then evangelicals just sort of assumed if you had that view this is sort of just like a Roman Catholic thing and here are these evangelicals going no no they're actually <laughs> right about that and mm -hmm. uh, it created this this thing it still it still holds up it's still a great book just a little bit awkward because. It's written by Gordon Wenham and William Heth. William Heth eventually changes mind, uh, but I think it's clear that he changes mind. Uh, part of it was, I think, because he couldn't cope with the pressure that he was under um, mm -hmm. after that book came out. But Gordon Wenham remained uh, still standing by what he argued for in the book. So, yeah, those would be some recommendations, I think, to check out. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you're interested, definitely check them out. Um, I think uh again if you're anglican and you're 
concerned about retrieving the historic Anglican position. I don't think it's even up to debate that this is the historic Anglican position. So if you're all about like theological retrieval, like this is the position to retrieve, you know, yeah. um, uh, it's it, if anything, it, it could be even one of the distinctives to which you would argue someone sh sh ought to be, especially in a previous age, ought to be Anglican as opposed to some other Protestant denomination, especially, yeah. but um, is being uh, faithful to this uh, clear command of scripture. Um, yeah. Anyway, thanks so much for, for coming on. I really appreciate uh, just doing a thorough deep dive on the issue. Um, the book recommendations were great. Um, you were great to have on. Thanks so much for coming on. River. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was great uh, to talk to you. And I hope for all the listeners that this has been edifying and that um, it will just help you to obey the Lord's teachings more.